Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome, welcome. Get to your seats. I know you guys are rushing in. <laughs> uh, welcome to Business Side the Game. I'm Baron Davis, uh, your host and uh, founder. Uh, Business Inside the Game was started as an opportunity for athletes, celebrities, influencers, investors, entrepreneurs to have a, a place and a platform to talk about uh, wins in business, how you transition in business, uh, what your core values are, what are your intangible values are that help you transition. And we've been doing these town halls and these town halls um, you know, uh, in recent with COVID and also, uh, you know, with, uh, with, with what's going on in the world as far as social justice is concerned, we decided to come together and really start to mobilize our community, mobilize our thought leaders. And um, tonight is uh, round three. Uh, and so everyone, welcome to uh, the big town hall. Uh, this one is called Each One Teach One. And we'll be discussing education, education on all fronts. Uh, we'll be talking about structure, economic structure. Uh, and be, without further ado, I just want to get into my panelists because they're all incredible people. Um, and I will start with uh, Malik Hubbard. Malik is a Democratic campaign strategist. I love the word strategist. Serves as a senior advisor and political strategist for businessmen, uh, philanthropist, and grassroots leader Tom Steyer. In 2016, uh, in the 2016 presidential election, Malik served as the national deputy of African American vote director for Hillary uh, for America. He was a co-founder of Moving Ohio Forward, which turned out African American voters in the state's six major cities. He serves as the operational vote director uh, in charge of um, voter engagement in Ohio for President Obama in 2012 in his reelection campaign. Malik is also uh, a partner at Inclusive, an organization whose mission is to ensure there are biopic voices represented in political, government, advoc and advocacy organizations. Malik is a graduate of the Ohio State University. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Malik Hubbard. Uh, next up is uh, Ksenia Yudini, Yudina, sorry, Ksenia Yudina. And she is the founder of uh, a growing platform and new platform, the CEO of UNEST, the first mobile app that makes it easier than ever before to create and manage tax-free college savings accounts. Uh, Kasinga is an entrepreneur and a financial expert with over 10 years of experience in the financial industry. As founder and CEO of UNES, she has spearheaded the development of the Breakthrough FinTech solution and raised funding from leading venture capital funds. Also myself, I'll have to say I'm an investor. Uh, Kasinga holds an MBA from the prestigious school uh, sorry, of the UCLA and uh, of the UCLA Anderson Business School. Um, ladies and gentlemen, CEO of UNES, Kasinga Yudina. Dr. Elisa B. Richardson. Dr. Elisa B. Richardson is an assistant professor of journalist, journalism at, at USC Annenberg. She researches how marginalized communities use mobile and social media to produce innov innovative forms of journalism, especially in times like these times of crisis. Richardson is the author of Bearing Witness While Black, uh, African American Smartphone and the New Protest, Hashtag Journalism. The, books, the book explores the lives of 15 mobile journalist activists who documented the Black Lives Matter movement using their smartphones and Twitter from 2013 to 2017, ahead of your time. Uh, Richardson's research is informed by her award-winning work as a, journal, uh, as a journalism instructor. Her work has been published in many venues. Richardson holds a PhD in journalism studies from the University of Maryland College Park, okay. A master's degree in magazine publication from Northwestern University and a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Xavier University of Louisiana, where she was named top 40 under 40 alumni. Okay. 
Thank you, Dr. Lisa Richardson. Next up is a good buddy of mine, Mark, Martin Moto. Martin is the founder and managing partner of Solar Impact Fund. Solar Impact is one of the leading funds in the opportunity zone sector and has done so by achieving market rate returns by delivering on its mission, doing well by doing good. Uh, Solar Impact also has a foundation, is Solar Impact I Can, where they are building facilities, partnering with USC, uh, whether it's uh, esports to science to learning, building out uh, not only uh, great opportunities, but building the opportunities in the opportunity zones. Um, Solar Impact's uh, $100 million opportunity zone is one of few. Uh, and they're actively deploying capital in uh, South Los Angeles. A professional investor and entrepreneur for over 20 years, Martin has been successful at leveraging private capital to drive positive social change. He graduated with honors from the Warden School of Business and the University of Pennsylvania. Ladies and gentlemen, Martin Motel. And last but definitely not least, Lori Raleigh. Lori is a social entrepreneur dedicated to developing solutions that improve financial security. Currently, she is the co-founder and CEO of Icon Savings Plan, a new kind of retirement savings plan built for the modern workforce. It's absolutely phenomenal what you're doing. I had to stop and say that. Um, it's universally accessible. Uh, fully portable and easy to use. Lori has a background in behavioral finance and research helping launch the behavioral finance form. She is widely regarded as an expert in retirement savings, financial decision making, human centered design, and product innovation. Ladies and gentlemen, Lori Raleigh. Whew, I got through that. Now, thank you guys. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. I want to thank you guys for. Uh, young men and women for being a part of this. I wanted to um, just kick this off and um, I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Lisa Richardson. Um, you know, in the, in the recent wake of, you know, uh, these social changes, right? And, you know, you wrote a book in 2013 uh, basically dealing with what we're dealing with now. What, what has changed since then? And then what do you see are, are a lot of the similarities that we can pick up on to kind of move ourselves forward? You're on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I actually started uh, researching the book in 2014 when it was my first week of my PhD program, and that's when Mike Brown was killed. And that's when I realized that a lot of the research and in keeping with our theme of each one teach one really had to be more about uh, me educating people about the possibility of using their smartphone as a device that could possibly save their life. Before that, I'd really only been focused on using the smartphone to teach young girls in the US and in Africa how to speak up. And that's pretty much all the projects that we were working on. I was working with an organization called Global Girl Media, and we were really trying to explain to young girls why it was important to be journalists. Well, now if we fast forward to today to answer your question, we see young girls like Darnella Frazier who are picking up the camera and recording what happened to George Floyd without needing any kind of prompting or education, right? There's that inherent kind of being in the wrong place at the right time that is really mobilizing these young people to participate in ways that they haven't before. So during the course of my study, I decided to kind of shift from talking about the use of girls and being empowered through journalism to really how African Americans have bore witness to injustice throughout history using journalism. And that really took me on this kind of journey to see who were the main media makers. And after I found them, I stuck with them for a number of years to really watch their phenomenal rise, Baron, from just being on those front lines in Ferguson to now doing TED Talks, being Harvard Fellows, being on President Obama's Policing Commission, um, being commentators for MSNBC, and all of this happened because of the power of their phone and black Twitter. So when we talk about today, um, te each one teach one, it really starts with storytelling, right? And the kinds of stories that we tell each other as a culture 
what's important to pass on in the first place in the classroom. And so that's what I'm really passionate about. That's amazing. Malik, would you love to piggyback off that as far as, you know, uh, I feel like the work that you've done is, is, is super complimentary uh, in your career paths. Would you just, you know, elaborate on that and, and, you know, what does each one teach one mean to you? Yeah, I think that, you know, in the wake of a lot of the um, um, police killings and murders, I think things have significantly changed over time. And we're talking about like policy development, people being more involved in the electoral process and things like that. Um, when I, I think when I first um, really knew that something was amiss and something was going to change was right after um, Freddie Gray uh, was killed by the police. And I was uh, actually on a march to justice when we marched from New York City uh, to D.C. carrying legislation. Um, it was an eight-day walk um, in, uh, to carry legislation to Congress to ensure that, you know, there is a conversation that's happening around this, uh, these, these murders and, and what police are doing to people. I think that, you know, as far as like each one teach one is, is how, how it's important is that there are people that are involved in these movements and there are some that are not. And it's, it's important that we let the public know what is actually happening out there. Um, because I think the, the, the worst thing or uh, that, that can happen is in, in, in how oppressed people are controlled is by misinformation. And so if we can do that and kind of conquer that, I think that helps us to, to get the, the real information out there um, and so we can be uh, re not, not always reactive, but proactive in what happens to us in our communities. That's amazing. Um, Ksenia, would you, would you love, like, you, you, your, your attack and, and your fight is, you know, uh, a little bit different. Uh, will you talk about, you know, uh, why you started the platform of UNEST and, you know, uh, what is your mentality around each one teach one? you know, with, uh, with your financial literacy uh, platform? Uh, yeah, sure. So our goal, our mission as a company is basically to democratize access to financial solutions, right? Uh, and create those equal opportunities for all children, irrespective of their race, ethnicity, background, income level. Um, so something that's been previously only available to kind of wealthier people, we want to make sure that we get those solutions in the hands of all people. And I would say that education, right, is something that can really advance you in life. Mm -hmm. And lack of those educational opportunities is something that can really be a huge setback, especially for people of underrepresented, like underserved communities. So that's where we as a company kind of step in and just making those solutions that's been previously very confusing, expensive, you know, time consuming for people, you are making them simple, accessible, affordable. Right. And yeah, keep going. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. And, and, you know, like just some, some interesting statistics, right. Is that uh, children that have a little bit of savings are seven times as likely to attend college as children that don't have anything saved, right? Just empowering those parents by saving a little bit, starting early, and getting a little bit in those children's savings account, you're basically creating more opportunities for what you stood down college. And college can make a whole difference. Absolutely, absolutely. Lori, uh, just piggybacking off of each one, teach one. You know, how can we ensure that underserved communities have access to financial literacy literacy programs and you know what kind of role does that play in ending social justice for injustice yeah so first of all i want to say thanks Fern. it's great to be here with you i love the each one teach one um Thank title you. of this i think it's awesome and just really happy to be here tonight um yeah i mean you know if we think about you know what the theme is of each one teach one and, and what's why we started icon right now we live in a country where over half of the workforce doesn't have access to the most important asset building tool that we have available which is a retirement savings plan and if you look at communities who are most impacted by that it's women and people of color so you see these widening economic gaps between those two groups and the reason why is that people, um, you know, if you don't work for an employer, you don't have a retirement savings plan. 
And so the idea here is how do we modernize retirement savings in a way, make it universally accessible and easy for everyone to save, make every employer able to offer a retirement plan that is, doesn't cost them anything, that's easy to use, simplify. Technology can help solve a lot of these problems. Um, before it used to be very expensive to offer these kind of plans, but now you can do it at scale for you know, a fraction of the cost. And in doing so, really pave the way to start to close that economic you know, gap between people that have access to wealth building you know, programs and people that don't. Um, you know, I don't want to get into a bunch of statistics, but they're not good <laughs> in terms of people that, you know, that have access and, and people that don't. And in terms of each one teach one, you know, we're, our country as a whole prior to COVID, you know, trust in financial institutions was really, really low. So it's very hard for people to believe information that they see coming from financial institutions, you know, education. Um, and so I think what's really interesting and important is to, and I love, I love the work that you're doing, uh, Dr. Richardson, about how do we empower people to communicate to themselves about better financial decision making and other kinds of um, opportunities and, uh, you know, ways that people can take more control of their own sort of financial future and financial wellness. Love it. Love it. Uh, love it. <laughs> love it. And Martin. Uh, each one teach one, you know, as an investor, um, your decision to, you know, take private capital and invest it in South Los Angeles, uh, one of the, let's call it one of the most uninvestable cities, you know, uh, over the last 30 years. Talk about, you know, what each one teach one means to you and the work that you guys are doing with Solar Impact. Sure, Baron. Great to thank you for having us. It's great to be part of the discussion. I think I'll make two big points. One of them is that you know, when we look at this, we almost take a step, a half step back. We look at some of the pillars that define uh, the social determinants of health, and more importantly, the social determinants of health and wealth and well-being. And what we look at is about a couple of pillars. One of which is is health access. Another is food access and food security, um, educational access and, and access to education, uh, housing and, and health care. And really, we, I think the first thing is that it's great. And I watched some of your other panels, and I think you have started to approach it with this holistic view of how do we look at these multiple pillars that ultimately impact the health and well-being of black and brown communities. To make it incredibly stark, we looked very deeply at, you know, if you take 90044, which is one of its South Central, Maine, South Central, 90, uh, 86th and, and, and um, Manchester, you know, we're, we're right at the, the intersection of 86th and Vermont, rather. That's our headquarters. That's where I've been working for the last 12 years. And you drive 12 miles from that point to Brentwood, right? Get on the 405, it may take a minute, the traffic is coming back now, but that 12 miles, a, 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 a male loses, or gains rather, 12 years of life, meaning the average life expectancy of an African-American male in 90044 is 75 years, in Brentwood it's 87 years, it's 12 years. Every mile that you drive there, you gain $7,000 of income expectancy, right? So think about just the 12 mile commute from South LA to Brentwood and how stark that is. And so our view and our mission from our standpoint is we've got to address all of those determinants. You know, we're, we're um, initially primarily a housing provider, but education is really one of the main vehicles that we believe that gives people access to those determinants. And the, as you point out, we have a nonprofit affiliate, which is the Sola I Can Foundation, which was built on the premise that if you can't see it, you can't be it. Or on the positive side is if you can see it, you can be it. So um, I would say that our philosophy there is, is very similar to each one, you know, each one, teach one, it's reach one, and teach one and we'll talk later on about the incredible work that 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 team is doing 
to impact the community and build out the infrastructure to provide access to education as a means to access to wealth and economic opportunity. You're on mute. <laughs> I am on mute. Uh, thank you, Martin. Now, you know, let's get to the nitty gritty, right? Um, <clears throat> I would say for me, it's looking at, you know, edu like everyone in this, in this panel represents a different form of education, right? Um, my first question is what role is government playing, right? in the financial literacy capacity, right, in the educational capacity when it comes to actually getting on ground floor and ground zero? Or is that role now going to shift into, you know, the entrepreneurs and the people in the private sector? You want to tackle that, Malik? Sure. I mean, uh, um, like you whose know, responsibility I'm, I'm a, is it? Who's, res who's responsible at this point? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, it's, it's probably responsible of the government, but we know that's not happening. Right. And so what we have to do is make sure that the government works in partnership with entrepreneurs so that people have the correct information. I mean, when you're talking about financial literacy and things like that, and you're talking about black and brown communities, we know that that's not something that is, is, is present as it is in other communities. And so who takes that on? And so I think it becomes a responsibility of the community because you know, no, one else, no one else is gonna do it for you. And so I think part of that is holding government responsible. Um, so there's a partnership. And so when you were talking about like, um, you know, things like that, and even other things that have to do with policies that affect the community, the community has to be a part of that. And that's why our government has to look and reflect the government that, that governs it. Um, those voices have to be there. And so I think that people are now, and, and I think should, um, are be, becoming more entrepreneurialistic and also creating these organizations that are, that, that are advocacy organizations and, and, and watchdog organizations to make sure that the government is doing the right thing and making sure that the correct information is getting down to the people. Absolutely, absolutely. Dr. Elisa, you want to piggyback on I that? I hear entrepreneurship, I just, I don't know, I have mixed feelings about it because I know that in many cases, when African Americans attempt to be entrepreneurial, it's criminal, criminalized and it's seen as one of the key factors in the research that I've done for the book of encounters with police. If we think about, for example, what Eric Garner was doing uh, when police encountered him, he was selling loose cigarettes. If we think about what Alton Sterling was doing outside of his store with permission from the store owners, mind you, he was selling CDs and DVDs. So again, these kinds of entrepreneurship, these ways that um, certain sectors of our population have to undergo different ways of making money to provide for their families is ignored a lot of the times. And when we talk about entrepreneurship, that's often the first encounter with police when it's not a sanctioned business, if you will. I also think about George Floyd. What was he doing when he encountered police? He didn't have enough money to purchase what he needed to in the store and allegedly was trying to spend a, a fake $20 bill. We're in the middle of of a pandemic. And while I never would excuse anybody from doing anything illegal, I understand that there is a certain sector that uh, entrepreneurship is closed off to. I've also started talking and doing some reporting with local businesses here in LA, for example. And in my journalistic um, experience, they have not had the same experiences with uh, the Small Business Administration or some of the bailouts that were supposed to trickle down due to the big government intervention that we had at the top of the coronavirus um, pandemic. And so while some of the businesses that are not black owned did tap into that money and were able to stay afloat during the nearly four months that we were closed, I've seen a lot of black businesses begin to shudder. And so entrepreneurship, 
entrepreneurship has always been such a precarious thing for us because again, when I think about the storytelling, the stories we tell ourselves, Americans believe that entrepreneurship is this great savior, but we criminalize it for black people so often. And one more thing I'll add is when you think far back to what made Ida B. Wells move to the North in the first place, it's because three black men owned their own store and they were getting all the business in Memphis and white store owners didn't like that. They asked them, please close your business because we're not getting any business at all. You're getting all of the African-American business in the community. And they came under the cover of night and they threatened them at gunpoint and the men refused. They said, we will not shutter our business. They were taken out to train tracks and shot and left there. And that lynching is what made Ida B. Wells write a scathing editorial in a Memphis newspaper. And it ran her out of town because they burned her newspaper uh, office to the ground. So again, when I think about entrepreneurship and the Black experience with that, as we are on this eve of the Black Wall Street um, anniversary, it's always been fraught with this striving. that We know we can do these things. We know we can create these things. But the stories we tell ourselves around the sustainability of them is flawed. And that's what I'd like to get to when we talk about each one, teach one. What are some ways that we can further empower businesses so that they're business owners, so that they're not subject to this state-sponsored and vigilante violence that we've seen throughout time that has robbed Black people of the prosperity that they've tried to build over and over and over again, whether it's through a loose cigarette or a shop. It's powerful, powerful. Uh, Ksenia, can you talk about, like, I think that, you know, one, financial literacy is, is super important in that, especially where we are now. And, you know, kind of building that pathway from, you know, when, what we say in South Central is from, uh, from, from, from uh, school to the pen, right? Or from school to prison. Uh, how do we, how, how have you used your platform since, since the BLM movement to really start to focus on, you know, education and rewrite and writing the narrative. Because as a startup, as a startup uh, founder, like how are you tying and writing that uh, narrative into, you know, the black experience uh, and also just the uh, financial uh, literacy experience? Yeah, I'll add just a couple of words about government first. <laughs> okay. And I'll lead into financial literacy. So. My take on, you know, should we rely on government to solve these problems or should we rely on businesses and, and entrepreneurs? My take on this, we can't really rely on government and we need to take, like, we need to take leadership position and we need to try to make a difference ourselves. And the reason for, for that, like, I'll, t I'll just talk about, like, my own industry uh, because we are in, like, you know, we're offering people 529 plans, college savings plans that grow tax-free. These plans are sponsored by the state. States are government agencies, yet 70% of people don't even know that 529 plans exist, right? How can we rely on government to make those plans affordable and accessible to the communities? I'll tell you more. <laughs> After we launched, right, like, and our mission was to get those, you know, uh, financial solutions into the hands of people of all economic backgrounds, we were getting feedback from the government, from the states that we kill their business because we pretend too many accounts. Accounts are too small, meaning like they're discriminating against people of in, like lower income or middle income, right? Um, or we're creating just like too much work <laughs> for them. So we can't really rely on government. We just need to disrupt the industry. We need to make the change, right? If you want to change something in the world. Uh, in terms of financial literacy, I would say that as a company, we are big on education. This is like one of our goals to educate people about importance of education, about importance of college degree, how much difference it can make in someone's life and accessibility of it, right? That you don't need to be rich to get started. You can start with $25 a month, $50 a month. Just start investing small and over time, it will make a huge difference for you and your kids. So like over time, we, like, we're doing a lot of work uh, in educational space through blogs, through emails, through like, you know, webinars. Um, and I would say that the Black Lives Matter movement empowered us even more. It inspired us, right? And I would say that no one can stay silent in this situation. Like, this is not a choice. <laughs> so we've been, like, very clear to communicate our values to our team and our communities 
through emails saying that, look, what we stand for as a company is diversity, justice, equal opportunities for all, right? And we're like very clear about that. Um, another thing, like, of course, we partnered with influ influential people like yourself, because I believe that the only way to make a difference is like be together, right? Trying to solve this problem together. And I believe that, you know, we can achieve it. I'm very proud to be a part of this movement. I think it's a very powerful movement. Oh, can, can hear you for some reason, Baron. I think you're mute. I keep muting myself because the <laughs> helicopters keep uh, rolling by. Uh, but I love the work that UNES is doing because when you start thinking about what's missing, right? You know, uh, financial literacy. What is financial literacy, right? It's a part of this whole education system. And so, you know, government, right, is leaving us out with the information, right? And government is saying, you cannot start a college account for $50. Mm -hmm. And you're saying, you can start a college account for $50 mm -hmm. and you can pay $5 a month for the next 10 years. And this is where you can grow. Your grandmother can gift your kid, right? And mm -hmm. so the things that we were talking about is really like, and, and I want Martin to piggyback off this, is taking foundations like um, Sol Solar Impact I Can, right, and, and, and allowing them to set up their business, right, on the platform that creates so much more transparency, right, and it creates an ecosystem of togetherness. Martin, Martin, talk about, you know, the work that you're doing working with government, right, working in education, um, and then, like, you know, just just – I would say some of the difficulties that you face, right? And then, you know, the things that you're super bullish about as far as as an entrepreneur, knowing that, you know, government is not here to save us, but, you know, ultimately enable us. Yeah, I think that, look, I think our comments would echo a lot of what um, previous speakers have spoken about. We run, you know, we have about 1,500 units in the broader South LA area. We're talking Compton, Watts, South Central, um, and we have about 3,500 tenants, 98% of them are minorities, two thirds of them are um, low income and, and one in three has experienced homelessness. So we're talking about folks that have been overlooked. Um, the Solo I Can program runs a series of events and, and much of that what we've learned is a couple of things. One is, look, we, we, we did a series of financial literacy uh, classes with operational with Operation Hope and others. And, you know, the adults are very financially literate. The, many of them are unbanked and they go, look, if I only have $100 in my account and, and a big bank is charging me $12 a month, I know to close that account. So, so people think that they're not, but they're very financial literate, financially literate. I do think that our programs that have been most effective have been targeted at the youth. And I think that we all agree that that is the, the conduit for getting this. So not only do we have financial literacy classes, we put together, for example, a mock stock challenge. And we ran this program and it was fascinating to watch the kids. They each got a half a million dollars of virtual currency and were able to trade. And these kids that were middle school, pre-middle school, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, were trading stocks every day and going, oh, I shouldn't have gone long on retail. And, and look, I grew up in, in, in West Africa. I didn't know what the stock market was until I got to Wharton. <laughs> Folks were trading in the halls and I was like, what, what is this world we're dealing with? And so getting youth exposed not only to savings, which it sounds like there's a number of great vehicles to do that, but investing you know, we fundamentally feel that, look, entrepreneurship is absolutely part of the solution. I agree with you that, that, look, being in South LA for the last 12 years, we know the hustle, we know the hustle. And, and, these, and, and, and the fact is what you're seeing with young black men that are hustling out there and often doing stuff that is in the gray or, or even in the, is that they're frustrated. They're saying, look, I have the talent, I have the drive, but I'm not being given the opportunity to participate equally in the economic system. So it's incumbent on us, it's incumbent on government, but it's incumbent on us as, as economic leaders to, to profile and mentor and show the pathways of being able to do it 
within the constraints of the current system. It's not always perfect, but I think that, you know, I, I have, and Baron knows this, I have negotiated with drug dealers. I have, I have talked to pimps and, and evicted pimps, and, and these are entrepreneurs, right? And the issue is that they have gone to a form that they, they feel is the only avenue. And some of these folks, had they been born in a different place and with different social structure, maybe different, they would be going to Ivy League schools and be, you know, excellent investors on Wall Street. So it's, it's, it's incumbent on us to, to find the pathways and to mentor them and to give them the opportunity and keep them on that straight and narrow. And it's, in, it's incumbent on them for us to hold them accountable. Say, look, it's, it's, there's no overnight success here. These are years, 10,000 hours of putting in the time. And, and if we do that, it changes minds and it changes lives. And so um, it is, you know, it's been incredible to be on the ground floor dealing with this, not anecdotally, but in a day-to-day -day basis, um, you know, in, in Normandy and Figueroa and, and Vermont and, and a lot of these neighborhoods. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's great and, and, and big compliments to the work you're doing. Lori, I think uh, with you, it's like you, you, as an entrepreneur, you figured out a way, right, to hold, and we're going to go into accountability next, but hold government accountable, hold corporate accountable, right? And build a product that is going to allow, let's say, you know, because what's happening is like allow the workers, right? The people who are actually like, you know, uh, doing the job to really preserve and learn what they're missing. Can you, can you talk a little bit about, you know, uh, how you're being disruptive, you know, uh, kind of playing you know, in this space where you, you, you're touching government, you're touching corporate, but you're also uh, enabling, you know, uh, the entrepreneur or, or the small business person. Yep. Um, sorry about that. It's on mute. Um, yeah, I just went back up. I'm going to jump right into that. But as a segue, I want to say for the last 10 years, I've been doing a study every year uh, with 5,000 people across the country measuring financial literacy and financial capability. The idea there is to really understand what are the key drivers that get people to make better financial decisions and what's really going on. And what we've discovered is that trust is a key driver. When you don't trust um, the system, you don't, you don't understand it, you will not engage with it, right? So, so many people don't understand how investing works, how compound interest works, you know, just the basic fundamentals of investing and saving. And what we've done with that research is taken it and designed information and education components that are not in any way dumbed down, but are simple, right? So we've taken complex ideas, we've made them in easy to understand concepts. And when you do that, you see across the board, um, at every income level, people will save and invest money at much higher levels when they understand it because we've de-risked it. Um, what we've done specifically with ICON is that we have, you know, people want to save for retirement, they just don't know what to do. We're, and we are conditioned as a society to um, save for retirement through our employers. And when our employer doesn't offer a plan, we don't save because it's just too complex and overwhelming. Few people could figure out how to set up a pension plan for themselves that would last their entire lifetime. So what we've done is really piggybacked on this idea where the government is saying, okay, we want small businesses, we want all businesses to offer a retirement plan to their workers. But 401k plans, which are the way people have done it, are really outdated. They're expensive for small businesses. Many businesses can't own them. Uh, or offer them because of the cost and the expense. So we've been able to really transform the idea of workplace savings from an, a plan that an employer sets up, manages and operates, which is very expensive for the employer and generally very expensive for the individual. And we are the plan. So the employer can now, any employer in America can set up an ICON account. It takes about 10 minutes for them to do it. They, it doesn't cost them anything. They have no fiduciary liability. They don't have to pick up the funds. They don't have to be experts in investing. And then they make it available to their workers. The workers participate. And when you leave your job, you don't have to roll that 401k over. Your plan stays with you from job to job so that we can ensure lifelong savings. There's no disruption in your savings coverage. It's low cost, super easy to use. And people are 15 times more likely to save and invest when they're offered a plan through their employer than if they do it on their own. 
So the idea here is how to really, really empower people with the tools and information they need to make the decisions that are in their own best interest and align our best interest with their best interest. So we're a fiduciary too. So we have to act in the best interest of the individual. That is not required in the 401k system. Malik, talk, you know, how do we help? You know, uh, let, let's, let's start unpacking a little bit. How do we help? How do we cut through the scar tissue of lack of information, right? And then how do we, you know, like, how do we get there? You know, uh, get, give me an idea. Give me a solution. Give me, you know, I, I know you've been working on, on this. How do we, how do we you know, unstitch uh, the way that we've been institutionalized as a country and how do we get to those young African-American men? How do we get to those young Brown Latino uh, men and women? Right. And then how do we, and then I'll go to you, uh, Dr. Richardson after that. You know, that, that's a real tough question. I think, um, I think one thing we're, we're talking about the role of government, um, just, just a few seconds ago. And I, I uh, actually was one of the deputies of uh, the, the governor of Ohio a few years ago, Ted Strickland, and I worked in his office for four years. It's so a really understanding how government actually works and, and how they are able to, or what they're supposed to do, what they're doing sometimes are two different things, right? Um, so if we're talking about financial literacy or we're talking about entrepreneurship, you know, if you want to start a business, you have to do it through the government. There's, not, there's no other way to do it. Like, I'm new to, I'm new to, um, California, but in Ohio, you go to the Secretary of State because that, that governs your business there. Or if you want your tax ID number, you have to go to the federal government to do that. So the other thing is, is that we have to understand that our educational system is the government as well. So we're talking about who's on the school board, who's creating curricula for, uh, for these, you know, young black and brown people. I think we are in a interesting situation right now with COVID-19. Everywhere around the country, people are trying to figure out what is the best way to educate their, their children in the, the midst of this pandemic. So I think what gives us the opportunity is we have to rethink how we're going to do this completely. You know, what are our, what are our buildings look like? What are the time spans we have to be in school? So I think at this point in time, it is, you know, also with the, um, the murder of, of, um, um, uh, Gregory George, or I'm sorry, Gregory, Gregory Floyd, um, I think people are more active and people want to be more involved in the process. And so, like I was saying before, you know, it doesn't have to be running for office, which I think is a good thing to do. It could be, it could be starting an organization to make sure that you are watching the government agencies to make sure that, hey, we're correct, we're creating curricula, we are making sure there's things are equitable. You know, one of the big things that, that is, that's uh, really playing now is the digital divide. And so, you know, people are like, you know, COVID is here. Um, just use your computer and go home and we'll teach people by the internet. Well, everybody doesn't have a computer and everybody doesn't have internet. <laughs> so, I mean, those type of things we have to think about and we need people from the community. Who are these people who are vulnerable to give them the voice to say that. That's the only way we're gonna be equitable here. And I also think the other thing is how we're rethinking things. We, if we know that um, the oppressed people in this country are oppressed by systematic racism, uh, racist ways of doing things, we have to know that we can't send our black and brown kids out and expect them to do things the way our, our, our non-black and brown people do it. And so I think that it does come with mentorship. I, it does come with coaching. Um, I think that's, you know, a, a concept now that's becoming more, more, uh, more prevalent um, that we are, we're, we're taking our young and we are teaching them the things that they need to know either specifically by, um, by profession or just kind of in a generalistic way. But I think that those things are hugely important. It's just really getting involved point that's a great point that's a great point and uh and uh dr richardson i would say uh to uh to malik's point he you know the government is you know the government government is our enabler right and you know for all so long you know i i question what is education 
right? And so my question to you is, is there an opportunity to rewrite what the foundational tools of education is? Because to me, it, it feels like we're already starting uh, from an, an inferior position. So, you know, how do you feel about, one, uh, uh, you know, as a as a journalist teaching journalism how can we rewrite right and what are some of the tools that we can start thinking about to rewrite uh, education i think that's what um african americans have done so well in this moment and throughout points in history is that we've always done a lot with a little bit and as we've seen in the past i talk about book three overlapping eras of domestic terror against black people, which began with slavery, which gave way to lynching, which then mutated to what we have now, which is police brutality. And through all, all those eras, you still have African Americans who are striving to tell a story, to tell narrative, to rewrite what is being written about them through racist advertising, through movies that depicted them in, in blackface and in ways they knew they weren't. And so much of the African-American experience has been around recasting and rehashing uh, a narrative that was never true in the first place. And so when we think about how African-Americans come to story, we find that there's really not that deficit and that we're not really starting from behind. We're actually very creative um, and, and ingenious, quite frankly, with communication. And that's why we see the statistics showing African-Americans over-indexing on sites like Twitter, sites like Facebook and Instagram every single day, even though uh, only 13% of the population, anywhere between 30 and 40% of African-Americans are on these platforms all of the time in comparison to non-Black groups, which spend about 10 to 12% of their time on these. It's not because they're wasting time or playing games. It's because they're looking for the truth. And in these places is where you will find a lot of the grassroots coverage that you don't see in mainstream media yet bubble up from the top. So as we begin to think about this miseducation of the Negro, as we've called it in the past, in uh, that titular novel, titular book, uh, we have to think about the education that we received was so much, uh, so skewed because we weren't allowed to read and write in the first place. It was illegal, unlawful. But as soon as a few of us did get a chance to read, that's where this each one teach one philosophy came from, right? We were then passing on that literacy to the next generation. And that's what this generation will need. We will need a media literacy. We will need to know whether it's the left or the right talking to us. We will need to be, we will need to know how to identify dog whistles when we hear them. When we hear things like when the shooting, when the looting starts, the shooting starts, we need people who can bring break that down and say, wait a minute, that is a, a dog whistle from an old callback from the 60s from a police chief that was not for, you know, public protesting and for the First Amendment. We need people who can connect those historic dots and say, these are not just words. And from that, we start to form a new kind of collective crowdsourced education that really relies on everybody at all different levels, not just professors, but everyday people who can put their pictures up and say, hey, slavery wasn't that long ago. Here's my great grandfather in Oklahoma, and here's the property he lost. Or here is, you know, some artifact that I have from my history that shows this is just two or three generations back. And in doing that and retelling the American story to include Black history as American history, history, we can then right. make better policy decisions about where we want to go because we're no longer ignoring, you know, things that we wish wouldn't have happened or pushing them to the back. And I think that's been the great achievement of this uh, George Floyd uprising and the Black Lives Matter movement as a whole. And that uh, new education, to answer your question, will require everybody to constantly pick apart and question where they're getting their information, whether it's trustworthy, and why they believe what they believe. That's awesome. Uh, Cassini, would you want to, can you piggyback off of that? Because uh, we're talking, you know, uh, Dr. Richardson is talking about our history, rewriting our history, right? And rewriting the perception of who we are, right? Digging into the archives and, and, and being of true, right? And with that, we know that there are very limited resources, right? So you're not getting the history Right, and now you're not getting the resources to be able to strengthen that, strengthen you know uh, your your pathway to college. Talk about uh, 
from a platform perspective, you know, uh, talk about from, you know, a college perspective, and I'm sure you may have some stats, like how can we start to untangle those chains, right? And use plat use fintech platforms and financial platforms to now start to influence, you know, the history lessons of education, right? So how can you and Dr. Richardson figure out, you know, how to put, you know, together a recipe, just some ideas, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, I would say that in order to change the future, we kind of need to learn from the history, right? Like we need to learn those lessons, those mistakes that we made and trying to predict, you know, how the future can look like in 10 years from now. That's what we like as entrepreneurs are trying to do, right? Like not to focus on today, but focus on the long term, like what's what's in 10 years from now. And in, in my mind, like future starts with providing opportunity for opportunities for children, right? We want those children to have different opportunities. We want, we want those children to change the world. In order for them to change the world, they need to be educated. And they like their parents need to have opportunities to like financial opportunities to put them put them through college uh, to get them like, you know, um, some, you know, things that are right now only available for kind of wealthy, wealthy people or like me, me to uh, upper income. So like in my mind, it all starts with children. Let's, let's think about like how we can educate these children, how we can provide uh, the children the opportunity so they can change the future. They can, you know, shape the future of the country. Um, and like, you know, as a platform, like that's what we're doing. We're basically enabling, empowering those parents to start, you know, saving small, simplifying the process into like five minutes, uh, becoming advocates, becoming the advisors for those parents. So they're not afraid. They, you know, it's, it's so simple. It's like, it's so easy to, to get started that anyone can do it, right? Like you don't need to be like super educated. You, you don't need to have access to financial advisors to get started. So that's how we're trying to change that world. Love that. And then Lori, I feel like I, I'm, I'm just going to start, you know, just bouncing around. Lori, I feel like, you know, your platform, right? You know, including like, okay, now we're in the history. Now we're in the financial literacy. Now the kids have this education and the parents can actually do a better job, right, of, you know, saving that money. I know in the black community, the dollar stays about seven minutes right and uh you being an expert on behavioral finance like how can we you know once once these kids graduate or get jobs how can we like start to to develop let's call it a a, a middle class right from what you're building of workers that can actually crowdsource right or you know participate and you know, helping see this pathway of success. Yeah, there's a really important concept that you're kind of touching on, which is social hurting, right? So we kind of want to do what other people are doing. And if we are promoting the idea that savings and investing is, is a good idea, right? That has like a contagion effect with the people around it. So. Because the, the challenge is really how do we get people saving? And then once we get those people saving, it'd be, you know, it's great to have sort of influencers and see other people in the community that are doing that. That behavior spreads. What we don't want to do is make a bad decision, right? We don't want to save or invest because it feels painful for us to have to give that money away. If we can understand it sort of why we're doing it and the reason behind it and the fact that our money is safe. And if you give me a dollar, I will give you back $7 in 25 years. That's a big motivator, right? So we have to understand those triggers that get people to save now. And then how do we, and this is a, you know, a great topic to think about. How do we think about using sort of social motivators or, you know, social hurting to get people to, you know, participate in ways that are helpful for their communities, um, to create more opportunities for their family through wealth creation. And then, you know, that kind of spreads into communities and, and has a larger multiplier effect. That's awesome. Uh, Martin, you know, I'm coming to you. You're the do good. You're the do good and you're the do well, right? So how do we, you know, from a solar impact perspective, like you're going into these communities, right? You are, you know, talking to the people and trying to, you know, you're talking to the pimps and like, dude, if this dude could have went to Harvard, right? So um, for me, it's like, how do we 
how do we take what Lori's doing, right? And then how do we read, what kind of idea can we use from a solo impact perspective to bring in now these parents, right? And to actually do well and do good, you know what I mean? But how do we start to reverse the narrative and actually get people to invest in black community, in the black community, right? As you have in the black venture. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, so if you could piggyback on that for me. Yeah. You know, I have four very specific things because I've, you know, done a number of these town halls and, and folks are sort of like, well, what can we do? And how can we participate? What books should we read? And I go, number one, spend time with poor people. All of the stuff aside and reading, go spend time with poor people, get to know them, talk to them, understand, try to form a connection. I'll tell you, you know, that's the best education you're going to get on what it's like to be and, and take the time in that regard. That's number one. Number two is that we're in a very unique time in the country's history where the corporate world is getting behind the Black Lives matter movement, meaning corporations are, whether you think it's lip service or whether you think it's genuine, at the end of the day, what's different about this is that large corporations and, and economic forces are saying, we want to substantiate it. So for whomever is on your platform, Baron, because you've made this platform, you've got to go to those corporations and hold them accountable. Say, what are you guys doing around this? And because even if it's 5% of their customers, if they start to say, what are you doing specifically, they will react and they will move. And so I would really encourage everybody, every stroke of every walk of life to go to your corporations that you buy from, that you deal with, that you partner with, that you have contracts with and say, what are you specifically doing? Show me and I'm going to hold you accountable to living that through. That's number two. Number three is that, um, and, and Baron, you were privileged enough and, and kind enough to participate with us on this get technology into the hands of young people in black and brown. Absolutely. Right. So absolutely Aaron helped us. Um, we raised $40,000. We gave away 200 plus Chromebooks to our tenants that who were struggling with their kids keeping up with school because they didn't have adequate technology at one computer for a family of five and they were sharing. So, so that's a very tactical, anybody who wants to donate to that, we're still giving them out it's on solar impact. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Baron came down, spent his time in the midst of the pandemic. We, you know, social distance with Matt, Man. Away, these computers and we really are grateful for that final thing. And it's not to sound self-serving. It's more to galvanize people to, to get moving is, you know, over the last three weeks, we've raised a million dollars from incredible um, LA-based philanthropists where we're, we're going to give that to in scholarships around the COVID retraining and recovery fund, where we believe that a lot of people who have been furloughed and laid off, this is a great time to go back to school. And, and it doesn't mean two or four year colleges. A lot of this is vocational schools. We really want to encourage the South LA community broadly to look at this and as an opportunity to reskill and retool for jobs that are going to be in high demand in the future, which we believe are primarily in healthcare and technology, but it's a whole host of things. The solutions here are straightforward. We've got to have more black and brown CEOs, CFOs, architects, lawyers, professors, accountants, and, and that is, is part of it, but how we, the mechanics are important. So, Again, from our standpoint, we had access to incredible investors and friends of the fund that were generous. We're giving away a million dollars, which is going to be at least 200 scholarships, five, six, seven thousand dollars to get people in the right direction. And we will hold them accountable. What we are asking for them to do is when you do the program after you're finished, you're going to give at least 30 hours back to the community to be health ambassadors, to be tech ambassadors, come back to the community and share that knowledge. So to your point, it's reach one, teach one, each one, teach one. And that's, you know, how we're acting. And Malik, uh, you know, you, you're the senior advisor and uh, the political strategist from, you know, one of the top business people, you know, uh, of our time, uh, who's also a philanthropist, uh, Tom Steyer. You know, you have worked in government. Uh, you have 
worked on policy, worked with Obama, Hillary, you know, you've worked with the, let's call the high, the highest of steam of, you know, kind of minds, right? Um, how do we look at this from a, you know, working with someone like Tom Steyer, how do we look at this from a top down approach, right? You know, how do we, what are the tools, right? What are the different buckets, right? That we must pay attention to, to work ourselves if you could follow me, work ourselves all the way back to kind of grassroots education, right? So starting from finance and economics at the top, right? How does that trickle down, right? And uh, really hit, you know, from what we've said, I'm just trying to complete this will from history to financial literacy, right? To uh, employee financial literacy and, 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 uh, kind of crowd crowdsourcing, right, uh, these shared ideas to furthering the education and now actually paying homage and actually giving the opportunity, you know, to the African American and to, to the minority uh, uh, who's been underserved. How do we look at that from the top? And how do we get, you know, some of the top leaders in the world to start being a part of, you know, this movement? Well, I, I think it's really, you know, what everybody on this, this call is doing right now. Um, I think in different sectors that you all are working in, um, it's important that your work is amplified and elevated. And so I think that, you know, what we do, um, as, as Tom Steyer started Next Gen Climate uh, some years ago, to really get people to understand what's important um, in, in terms of this climate crisis we're in, and also environmental justice and how it relates to racial justice, and then kind of transitioning to Next Gen America, which is kind of all of that. Um, but it's a grassroots organization. Um, and so we use a lot of different tools, not only people, um, you know, just people to people uh, physically, but just like um, Dr. Richardson was saying, like having the, the, the technological tools to make sure that people are talking to each other. And one thing that we know as far as campaigns, advocacy organizations, um, once there's some groundswell, once there's some, um, some talk about what's actually happening and building a campaign to do that, it becomes more visible to people. We have the ability now to do that more than ever. I, I'm still impressed with, in the, you know, back in the day in the 50s and 60s when they did those huge marches and things like that, they didn't have the internet. But we do have it now, and we can use that as a tool uh, to educate people. So I think, you know, our, you know, our grassroots organizing, um, the way that we use it mixed with, you know, our digital, um, uh, our digital organizing is really an amplification tool so people know. And then you use people like Tom um, that have connections to people who are around the country talking about climate and environmental justice and racial justice um, and getting to people like that. I mean, the people that he talks to on a day-to-day -day basis is insane. And that's, you know, right now concentrating on one, the climate two, making sure we have a more progressive president <laughs> that is elected um, in November. Um, but I mean, I think those things are the important things to do. Um, and also just figuring out, um, like you were talking about earlier, what is the best way to communicate to make sure that those, it is, you know, you are teaching another person that can teach another person, teach another person. That's all grassroots organizing is, um, is really the educational piece. And so I think that's, I would have to say probably the, the best way to kind of elevate some of these things. Love it. Love it. And for me, I think, you know, uh, cause we're drawing close to a close here on time. You know, if I could really just kind of, as I've been listening, you know, I think it's a, uh, you know, it's like the big funnel approach, right? We have to start at the bottom. We have to start at the top. And then the middle is where we have to really invest, you know, our time, our resources, right? And, you know, it's, it's this movement has been super inspiring because when you start, you know, looking at where we are in modern times as free Americans, as black Americans, and you have, other races standing with us and you have other races being holding themselves accountable, holding government accountable, holding corporations accountable. And I think that, you know, just with the power of, of, of this panel and the continued conversations we can have, it's important, right? That we know our history, right? It's important that we find 
the the heroes. We tell the narratives that are narratives of success, narratives of financial success, narratives of educational success, right? We need to crowdsource, right? Or come up with shared resources, right? To be able to share those finances, to share that financial information, right? And pool our resources together, right? To create, let's call it a, a, a landing pad, right? Where the community, the middle class has an opportunity to get plucked or in Martin's uh, case can get uh, invested in, right? Um, and then that starts, you know, that starts that path to success, that path to college, right? And knowing that we can do small little incremental things, whether it's on our job or a 401k, whether it's, you know, um, my nephew or niece, right? Birthday presents, what is that 300, 400, $500 gonna do you know, whether it's buying them some Jordans now or letting that sit in a UNESCO account and being able to, you know, be able to uh, mature, right, and be able to subsidize some of this education. And then, you know, to Malik, from what he's working on and what, and what they're looking at is really how to look at holding corporate government accountable, right? And once that accountability is met, Right. Then being able to look at, you know, where we are from a 30,000 square, uh, 30,000 uh, foot view and say, all right, I, I, I'm going to use a hip hop term. Let's make it rain. Right. Let's 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 make the resources, you know, hit all the buckets that we necessarily need to. So, you know, I would like to thank all of you for being a part of this panel, being a part of this town hall. Uh, I know I'm more educated, uh, you know, each one teach one is, is something that has been, you know, a part of our, our culture and our revolution. And, you know, I thank you all for your insight and your knowledge. And usually, uh, and we always leave with uh, just a little 20 second, 30 second, uh, let each one of our panelists talk about, you know, what their business inside the game is, but I want to switch it up. Six years ago, we had the same movement. We are six years, you know, it's six years later, right? Where are we going to be in six years, right? And what are you going to do to make sure we get there? Malik. <laughs> uh, six years from now, I, I hope that we definitely have a better educational system. I, I hope that, you know, our, our um, organizations, our government, um, reflect people uh, that have divor di uh, diverse backgrounds um, and ideas. Um, as you mentioned before, um, um, with the help of my wife, um, we started uh, an organization called Inclusive five years ago. And the mission of Inclusive is to make sure that um, there are uh, um, people of color voices in government and advocacy um, uh, in, in business. Um, and what I noticed, you know, years ago, 20 years ago, when I got into campaigns, I was the only black person there and often marginalized. So what inclusive does is we make sure that they, that, uh, people of color have a support system. So we do, we do trainings, we do mentorships, we match people with, uh, people that work in their industry, whether that's digital, whether it's communications, whether it's campaign management, whether it's government affairs, you know, things like that. And so we can be supportive of, of each other as a community because that's the only way that we're going to make a difference. Amazing. Lori? Yeah, I'm mute. <laughs> you, know, you know, the current crisis with COVID has really laid out, you know, the existing economic problems that we have that have been there for a very long time. I think now is the opportunity to really seize the moment that we're in and you know what there's so much attention on these issues and really build a better future that's inclusive of everyone where everyone has the opportunity to build you know wealth and income and equality for themselves and their families and their communities and we're really committed um, to kind of you know leading that charge to, to start to help build some of that progress in those communities amazing amazing martin uh, you know, I'm very metrics driven. So we're a uh, housing developer first and we, in six years, um, we have a five year plan. So this extended six to build 10,000 affordable housing units in the broader South LA area. 
That's number one. Um, we'd love to have 72, which is six times 12, um, uh, entrepreneurial businesses uh, that are women-owned or, or minority-owned in South LA that we house uh, in the Beehive uh, as a project that uh, Baron is familiar with. And then ultimately, one of the other things we're building out is tech centers, you know, tech centers for kids using esports. And in six years, I'd love to have six of them. We don't have one yet, so it's a stretch. But those are, you know, let's come back in six years and you can uh, hold me accountable to whether we delivered on that. <laughs> uh, Ksenia. You know, th this whole conversation actually sparked uh, an idea what we can do six years, in six, like now, to make a difference six years from now. Love it. So, <laughs> we've been working on this kind of gifting feature where like parents, family can contribute into the child's account. And I think it's time to create a new movement. Uh, we can call it Black Kids Future Matters, right? And you can connect brands, you know, endowments, foundations, influencers, with <laughs> and, wow. and ask them to basically make a real difference for real kids like you know gift into you know black kids accounts like pick 100 kids and you can make it real difference and you can watch those kids succeed in you know six years from now so i will start working on that uh this was actually like very <laughs> productive discussion <laughs> and baron i i would say uh thank you you know, for being such a great role model for children, you know, and I think you're a big like, inspiration uh, for those kids to work hard, to get education, and to know that they can actually achieve success in life. Thank you. Thank you. Doctor, will you finish, round it out, finish this off? <laughs> sure. I think about six years from now, and I think of college professors think in, in chunks of four, because that's how our cohorts are. And I think about um, kids like Tamir Rice, who would have been a senior this year, who perhaps would have been coming to me, right, from Ohio. And I think about all of the little kids who now are having people like Tyler Perry pour into them and give them college scholarships now. Rayshard Brooks's kids now have, you know, tuition paid for due to his philanthropy. And I heard that uh, Gianna Floyd has several offers of free college uh, being placed at her doorstep as well. And I would like to see those kind of opportunities being granted to all kids, even if it's not an emergency, even if their parent did not die under tragic circumstances, if they want to go to an elite university like USC, you know, hopefully they would have a mechanism in place due to all the hard work of everybody on this panel to be able to come to us. And so I look forward to in six years graduating at least one more cohort of a four-year group and then six more master's classes because those are only one year and that total believe it or not is about 2,000 new people in the storytelling wow. pipeline telling our stories that we all care about here on this panel. And so I'm very passionate about this next generation of journalists because they're already stirring things up. Um, there's already big dust ups at major corporations and it's all because this generation realizes that there is a narrative that needs to be told differently and that we can all do it together. Love it, love it. Can't thank you all enough. Uh, I would say for me, my goal is to basically work with the government to create a business inside the game program at schools, right? How do we dig down into the industry of sports, the industry of food, the industry of Hollywood, the industry of economics and real estate, and actually start building financial literacy programs, right? That to Martin's point, give these kids the opportunity to play with the tools that they're gonna need uh, in their future. And so for me, I'm gonna continue to do this. Uh, I'm gonna continue to invest in my community. I'm gonna continue to rally and uh, one, continue to listen to excellent people and excellent voices uh, like yourselves. And I thank you. I thank you all out there for tuning in. Uh, I hope you took notes, send us notes, send us feedback. Uh, and we're going to continue to do this. So thank you all for having us. Welcome to Business Side to Game. See you guys. Mm -hmm.